So the Koreans, with, with the work we did, and of course, you cannot take it away, as I said, from the fact that they had the leadership, they had the institutions, they had the education, they had the discipline, in addition to the fact that they were facing North Korea. So that, you, that competitive... You know, you, you, know, you, you, were, you, know? you, you, you were pretty young then. So yes. I, I, I read all of that, and I realized that it would seem as if some of those recipes mm. had been brought to Nigeria. Uh, we had a SAP, the Structural Adjustment Program. We also had D3. We had a couple of other issues to jumpstart even our rural sector to the extent that we thought by now we would have gone back into timber export, the cotton business, the garnet business, so many other businesses that they thought would have opened up the rural areas and uh, mm -hmm. make even oil uh, just uh, a plan B for us. How? is it that none has worked and how can we make this work now that we see that oil is not that lucrative anymore? Well, oil is too lucrative. I'm always amused when we say, oh, let's just forget about the oil and go to other places. That's why I said it's not We've that had 40 years, <laughs> 50 years, since the 50s, late 50s, when we started producing oil, uh, instead of calling it a cost, this was a new opportunity for us to divert the resources from oil into other non-oil sectors. We were blessed with just about everything you can think of. Palm oil, rubber, timber, agricultural products, uh, agricultural raw material products, and so on. All of this should be not only highly developed, but also sources of foreign exchange revenue, exports. Competitiveness arising from applying uh, more capital, more techniques, accessing markets. When the U.S. program offered itself for us to access uh, those uh, areas for new products, we didn't do it. And as I said, part of the a major explanation is uh, leadership. But that means a whole lot of things. But also you talk about the rudiments of economic policy. Your prices have to be right. Your investment allocation has to be right. You had to do the uh, uh, project identification of what do you do. There was a time when I was in finance the second time. We were trying to re-encourage planting of trees because we wanted to produce pulp and paper. And we went on to advise people who wanted to fell these trees. For everyone you fell, you make sure you planted two. We continued. I don't know what happened thereafter. I was only there for a few months. I mean, after that, we introduced the value added tax. I left the scene. But there are so many explanations for why we didn't follow through. We should be a multi-export uh, country. So each time I hear about this, uh, we don't adjust our prices because we are um, the most ridiculous thing anybody can say. We should have been into so many then, things. Sorry to interrupt you again. Yes. Would you say then that we've missed our window of opportunity? No, it would not be fair because we still have them. We haven't missed them. We just have to learn quickly. As I said, the, the issue starts from the pricing. You see, your, your, your rates... Your rates fit in from the uh, micro commodity prices and so on and so forth. And it is as it's like there's a, a cut, cutting edge where you move from just domestic demand to export demand, but you have to maintain those prices. So we haven't missed out. We do have to realize what we need to do. But what are we doing today? We are spending a lot of time still talking about the fact that we only want commodity export. We must maintain our prices by maintaining, uh, I, I listened to Lagarde uh, when she was here. Uh, I'm sure she must have been chuckling to herself because these are things that should have learned 40 years ago. Definitely. Flexible prices so, so that the new commodities can move from being just domestic demand to export demand. Mm, Chimbo, so, sorry, uh, uh, just let me pop this in because you've always been a strong believer of IMF. Uh, no, from, there's no such thing as a strong okay. believer of IMF. Okay, this is part of the problem. Good, good. See, I, no, I, let I, me I wanted that. you so that you can clear. clear no, no, the let air. me explain that it's the most, you see, we are really, it's a pitiful situation, the, in, the lack of understanding. The fund, we are members of the fund. We'll be members from independence. We contribute part of, we pay for the trip that Lagarde took here. We are part of those that contribute. We contribute money that are used to assist countries who have had their export prices drop suddenly. 
It's the cheapest kind of funds and countries go for it first because it's so cheap. So why do we run away from it? No, you explain that to me no, uh, no, no, because, I, 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 because I should ask you, I I, why am I not out? Why will I be a supporter? You, you're the I, I never worked in the IMF. I worked at the bank. But really, any country will say, like, we have a heavy deficit component. You be looking for the cheapest funds to start with. Then you go on to the higher funds. I, I was making the joke uh, about how perhaps we would say uh, somebody should be going around and make sure that woman didn't leave any IMF loans behind me before she left. You see, we, we, we seem to be, we have that fetish, uh, well, almost emotional. What do you think that fixation? about the loans. Well, it's plainly uh, ignorance. It goes back to what we teach in graduate schools, in economic schools, in finance. Because you see, I'm sorry to say, professors even who are so befuddled, they, they have no clue. So this is just a source of financing. You have your budget, you have a, a deficit of 10. So how do you make up that deficit of 10? Maybe the first two you can get from the cheapest sources. Okay, you can talk about the fund, you can talk about the AFD, you can talk about uh, uh, either of the World Bank. Before you start talking about euro bonds and all these things that are higher costs and shorter maturities. Well, you know so, so, so it's, it's, it's something that, uh, as I said, probably if we can get some it, it psychiatrists to look it, into it, it this matter. It was saying that the experience <laughs> of Nigeria has not been very pleasant in that particular area. No, no, we haven't had any experience because whatsoever. You see, you know one thing, you know mm -hmm. one thing. I, I was in finance maybe a year plus, although most people think I was there for several years. And uh, some people said, oh, I was in Imo State as commissioner, and I came to Lagos and signed an IMF loan. Well, I don't know how many IMF loans we've signed. Do you know? So what experience are we talking about? There are countries that take this well, in their stride in every budget year. They take a bit of here, a bit from there, a bit from there. And you see a lower average cost for their borrowing, longer maturities for their financing. And they are doing very well. But not Nigeria. We seem to have problems, fundamental understanding. You say we've not had any experience, but what some people I, I, would remember I, I don't know what, yes. from, from structural adjustment programs. Ah, there I mean, we I, go. I was, I was, <laughs> there I was, I was still a child at that time, but what some people remember. Do you, who do you what, think, who do you think introduced a structural adjustment program? I've been writing a little bit about it. <clears throat> it was a presidential advisory committee. The IMF came to me and asked me, what is this FEM? You know, they call it the second tier of foreign exchange market. This was supposed to be countering what the bank and the fund were suggesting. I wrote a paper, I was the commissioner in Imo State. I never called it structural adjustment program. So it was uh, very knowledgeable professors who didn't want to devalue, who introduced FEM. But till tomorrow, Nigerians say it's the IMF. That said. The IMF had no part, they, they couldn't even understand what we were talking about. By the time they got on the scene, I'm telling you things that I've documented severally. They said, what is this, your second chair? I said, well, talk to my colleague who is now the new minister of finance. All those who know about it, they are still alive. A few have gone over, unfortunately, but those, many people can testify. So that also illustrates the, just the amount of misinformation we have in the system. You are so sure, uh, structure just, no, no, it didn't, it came from here. We can't. I saw the document with a date which already shows that there was a basic misunderstanding. You don't date a structural adjustment program because it's an ongoing thing. The minute I saw that date, 86 to 80 years, I said, for Christ's sake, you know, we're in trouble. Because okay. obviously these people didn't understand. Yeah. They were picking but, from what so they So perhaps had. there was a lack of understanding on the part of leadership that, you know, finally transferred to, you know, the, the followership as it were and informed their own experience. What they remember in that period was that prices went up.